Hey everybody, thanks for joining me this week here on Yard Coach. I appreciate your time very, very much. This week, we are covering the periodic maintenance and sometimes the repair of that all-important irrigation system that you have. We will talk about the common tasks and some of the not-so-common tasks. Taking preventative care of a very key component in the landscape all over the globe every single day is a key to long-term irrigation system health, therefore landscape health. Hey, I'm glad you're here. Join me today. We're gonna learn just a little something. Hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. Every Friday I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself, get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys, the new, modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner of today. Okay, let's first Look at this topic in the simplest ways possible for great retention, if nothing else. We can break it down by sections, then discuss each section. The key components of any irrigation system are these, the timers, the wire, pipe, valves, connectors, and spray heads. Now, really briefly, the timers for automating the system electrically, wire, obviously, the delivery conductor of the little milliamp current to the small solenoids on top of your valves. Pipe, and you know, pretty obvious, the carrier of the water out to the landscape. Valves, there's a couple different kinds. Both shutoff valve, anti-siphon valve, backflow preventer valves, and inline, inline valves. Connectors, those are the parts and pieces connecting all the pipe and all the heads and everything else. The spray heads, the water delivery devices that actually deliver water to your landscape. These key components are what we inspect, sometimes repair, or occasionally replace throughout an irrigation system. Whether it is a direct result of, say, damage, good old father time, or in some cases, just poor assembly and craftsmanship by either the person who installed the system or even sometimes the manufacturer of the parts and pieces themselves. As a responsible homeowner who gives at least two craps about the investment of their home, the landscape, and other things like vehicles and tools, etc., one should really place a sense of commitment and adopt a long-term habit of at least checking the irrigation system two times a year minimum. Two times a year. After winter, and before winter. For myself, it was four times a year. At the change date of each season, when it turns spring, summer, fall, and winter. Usually on the 21st, right? So let's take a detailed look at these six key components and how I approached each maintenance task, whether it was my own system or when I was called out to maintain, fix, or repair any other systems for customers. Let's look at timers. Timers are basically the brains of any automated irrigation system. I suggest we start with double checking the month, day, and year, and time of day, just to make sure. Make sure they are correct and working. If it's a Tuesday, it better say a Tuesday. If it's two o'clock in the afternoon, it should say two o'clock in the afternoon. It's really important as it will determine the correct time of day, week, hour, and how long each zone is gonna turn on by that timer. You know, if it's, uh, I don't know, eight o'clock at night, but it's really only four o'clock in the afternoon, there's something wrong and it needs to be changed. Days of the week to water and minutes for each zone. This is a key area of inspection as it will be you who sets the appropriate time per zone based on current and upcoming weather and season. If you know it's gonna be getting warmer, then you may be out there at least for lawns and some other unestablished type of stuff and making sure that maybe the each zone gets just a couple extra minutes. Or if it's really hot, maybe you have to uh, do a double day. You know, you, you water it maybe at six o'clock in the morning and you water it at seven o'clock at night because it's been 107, you know? So make sure that it's getting enough water 
that's where these inspections come in. Now, as the season progresses, you know, and things start to cool down, you do your fall check and you either eliminate, you either eliminate a day per week or you reduce the number of minutes per zone as you ebb off into fall and maybe even winter before you may have to just shut the system down, period. So at the timer, we can also check the wire connections. Usually always stay attached and rarely, rarely have I ever seen in the more modern timers, loose or disconnected wires within the timer box itself. I, was, I would suggest, just a suggestion, that if you have more than one wire going into the common wire port, just make sure that that, with maybe a little tug check, that everything is going well. Now, if you have found out, say, downstream from the timer, that one particular valve operated by this particular timer is not activating, then focus here first, then trace the wire to the affected valve. This can be really easy or really hard, depending on whether you installed the system or others and where the wire travels until it reaches the valves. If it's underground, ah, eh, you know, 95% chance everything's gonna be okay. What I have seen over the years is damage in and around the timer, maybe from something hitting the wire as it comes out of the timer box and at the valves themselves. I have seen every once in a while a, a rodent chew, like a mouse or a rat or ground squirrel, sometimes they'll chew the, chew the plastic casings and cause wire problems, but usually, usually not. Finally, as far as the wires, check out the valve and make sure that everything is still in the same position. There's no, there's no wire bundle loosening up. There's uh, nothing that has disconnected a wire from the, the entrance to each solenoid, you know, that little mini barrel thing that sits on top of the valves, all of those things. Now, if there's a wire disconnected, you can generally go get a replacement solenoid and rewire really easy. But check it out. You may have to get yourself an ohm meter, you know, a little electrical tester. You know, set it to the DC setting and go out there, turn on valve, whatever the valve problem is. Uh, if you have current at the valve itself, you put your common prong on the common screw or toggle, and then you go over to the valve that's having a problem and put it there, you should see some voltage, some voltage coming out of there. Now go to the valve that's a problem and do the same thing. You might have to undo the, the wire bundle and you'll have to check the, the wire that comes out of that affected valve, touch it to the common bundle, and then touch it to the, the wire that is going there. If it is no voltage, then you know you got a problem between the timer and the valve. And that's where things get a little complicated because you really don't know where. You might have to trace it. Maybe you ran it under the floor joist or something of a basement and then out through a wall. Maybe you have it underground coming out of a garage wall and going along a walkway. Wherever it happens to be, you know, you have to trace that thing down. Sometimes that can be a little problematic. Finally, regarding timers, clean the timers especially if it's an outdoor box, you know, clean the timer of any bugs or spider webs. Sometimes earwigs like to get up into those things and spiders blow all the dust out. Maybe uh, I used to use some, some canned air or I, if I had my compressor with me, I would turn it down on a lower setting and I would blow the inside of the timer box out and get rid of all the dust and everything. Wipe down the box on the outside and keep it, keep it nice. That way it's gonna last you five times longer. Also, something to remember that if you do have an automated timer box, it's going to have a backup battery. And depending on how old the timer is, it's either going to be a nine volt or it may be just a little coin operated one. Just like your smoke alarms in your house, maybe change them once a year, maybe twice a year at the most. But if you're really subjected to a lot of power outages and those outages last for a period of time, then you probably want to replace those batteries a little more often. Okay, let's move on. How about that wire? Only applicable to automated systems, obviously, and the electrical valves that they serve. Manual systems do not have any wire or timers. The wire from the timer to your valves can be easy to inspect and know they are functioning based on two things. At the timer, turn your system on. Turn it to a manual setting and then hit start 
and toggle through each zone, say like at a minute at a time. If each zone operates correctly, bam, son, there you go. You know your, all your wires serving all your valves are good. Time to move on. It's not too hard at all. Make sure the wires are uh, neatly bundled and wrapped at the valves, preferably all bundled up in tape and pointing up with the screw locks or the wire nuts pointing up so no water goes up underneath and rusts anything out. Just a little tip that I used to do. All right, moving on. How about valves? Valves, these guys, these guys are the workhorses of your system. They retain a constant water pressure on one side of the valve, on your main line, your service line to your irrigation system. Then they open up and close, allowing water to flow to your water delivering devices, whether it be lawn heads, shrub beds, spray heads, drip irrigation, whatever. But they're the ones that are turning on and off, on and off. So they work a lot. And they're basically based on a principle of vacuum. There's a little rubber diaphragm and some springs and a little, little magneto that's in there. And when that solenoid gets activated, it causes a vacuum break and then a vacuum reattachment. And that's what turns it on and off. Sometimes the inside of those valves, the diaphragm, uh, especially if you have really hard calcium carbonate water. Sometimes things can build up in there and you can have a very slow turn off or no turn off at all. And you got to turn your system off, unscrew or uh, undo the jar, whatever style of valve you have and clean that thing out. Sometimes you'll see a lot of white debris that's built up in there. And that thing has to be really clean to allow for that rubber diaphragm to create a good, good seal. So if you're having a really slow turn off, that might be an indicator. So also at the valve, you can also check the bleeder screw. If it's uh, anything on that valve is leaking at all, usually it's the bleeder screw that was not tightened down enough or to some, for some people, it's too tight and you over tighten it with a, with a screwdriver. And sometimes it'll get a micro crack in it and then the leak starts. Also at the solenoid, there's a little, there's a little rubber gasket at the base of the solenoid. And when you screw it down, it's only supposed to be barely finger tight, just enough to where it activates and shuts it on or shuts it off. You do not need to tighten the thing all by wrenching on it with your hands. You will not turn it off any faster or any better. So be careful with that little rubber gasket because those things are kind of fragile, especially if you have a lot of hot and cold throughout your year. You know that it does to like a rubber gasket. It can, it can like an O-ring, it can cause some wear and tear. So be careful of it. Any of the things that I've mentioned on the valves are easily replaced. You can get a a new bleeder screw, as long as it hasn't been cracked off inside the valve, then it becomes a little problematic. But uh, you can also get new solenoids. You can get new solenoid handles for turning on and off. They're easily replaced and you can even get the internal parts, the guts of the, the valve, the, the spring, the diaphragm, all those things are easily, easily replaceable. You won't find them a lot at the box stores. You'll either have to order them. Sometimes Amazon has them. Sometimes you have to go to a specialty store and order them, but they're, they're easily attainable. Lastly, on valves, if you want to go out and just check and make sure that everything's operating at a manual, you can turn it on at the bleeder screw. It'll start putting out a little bit of water and then you'll hear that rush of water in the valve. And that means it's operating correctly. Tighten the, the bleeder screw back down. It should turn off, not as fast as with a solenoid handle. Uh, you're going to find that it can take as much as five to 15 seconds before it builds up that vacuum in there inside that valve in order for it to shut down. But it's, it's a nice manual way of doing it. So you've checked it by the timer and now you've checked it at the valve itself. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the pipe. In many cases that I've serviced irrigation systems, I have found that pipe only fails from a couple of things. Breakage from shovel strikes, pick strikes, hoe strikes, mower strikes. Those are basically the pipe damage. And you will know if a pipe is broken. It's pretty darn obvious. You're going to have obvious blowout in and around the, the pipe break. You're going to have geysers and you're going to have flooding. These are all duh indications that uh, something's wrong. And if you don't have that, chances are all the underground pipe, if everything that you have is underground, is Good. If you're using PVC or even poly pipe, I really don't suggest having it not 
underground because UV light really tends to break that stuff down and turns it very brittle after a year or two. So if you can do it, if you do have a system, make sure it, the pipe stays underground. Now, repairs can be time consuming. More than anything, they're time consuming, but not necessarily hard. It's just tedious. Some can be really simple and then some can get kind of a pain in the butt, especially if you have a, a break at a joint and that that elbow joint or something is down underneath a couple other pipes. And now you've got to kind of wedge good pipes up out of the way and address the break at the elbow or whatever down underneath. Sometimes that can be kind of a problem, but it's doable. You just have to be patient. You have to have the right parts and you have to have a plan when you go in there. It's just not dig, 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 dig. You have to be able to locate, identify, and determine a cure for it before you go trying to cut pipe and stuff. Most of the time, the old dresser coupling or expandable couplings, or even now they have those 12 and 18 inch flexible, twistable couplings that you can repair pipe with. The biggest thing when you're dealing with those things is measuring. You know, they are so simple to install, but if you cut too much pipe out and you don't have enough to expand your repair coupling, you expand it all out, you got a coupling at one end or a T or something, and now you're an inch, an inch too short, and now you gotta do another coupling, a section of pipe, and then your dresser coupling, and put it, put it back together again. I always tried to follow the adage of measuring twice and cutting once, but there's been times where I would measure twice, three, and four times before I, made a final cut. And it's just, you don't want to spend any more time on it than you have to, so. There's a, a school of thought when it comes to PVC pipe that everything that is constant under pressure should always be a thicker walled pipe, like a, a Schedule 40 pipe and not the thin wall pipe. It can handle it, but just, you just increase your, your risk of a blowout. The Class 200 can handle up to 200 PSI, but I wouldn't do it. And a lot of people like to use the Schedule 40 thick-walled pipe all the way out in the field as well, because it can it can handle a, a hit or something a lot better than some of the thin-walled pipe. Uh, the poly pipe, poly pipe, they make it better now than they used to. It is thicker than it used to be, but uh, you got to be careful because a uh, a sharp shovel and you forgot where that pipe was, it'll still it'll do a slit in it and you will be done. You gotta go get pronged couplings to repair that. Okay, let's move on to spray heads. Whether these are lawn heads of one kind or another, whether they're drip irrigation or drip tubing, they all require a periodic look-see. Lawn heads can become a problem from a few issues. The ones that I've seen the most, heck, I've even suffered some of these, edgers. The old bladed edgers used to hit spray heads and crack the assembly body or the string trimmer can sometimes hit just the nozzle and it'll deform the nozzle enough so when it activates it comes on instead of spraying a 180 half moon circle it does more of a half goes straight up the other half goes a quarter and yeah it's kind of broken so the spray deformity comes into play the other one is a lawn encroachment uh, which causes basically a lack of pop-up ability problems. Nozzle blockage and freedom of rotation for the rotor heads or canister heads, they can all be a problem. And I suggest that you get yourself a, a good linoleum knife or a, a leftover paring knife that you keep for the, your toolbox and go out there probably twice a year and just gently cut the lawn back away from each head so there is no encroachment onto there. The other thing is bugs. Uh, during this hot summertime in some of the drier parts of the, the country and world, bugs find water and they're going to come back to them over and over and over again. You know, in Northern California, we used to have uh, the earwig infestation. And in the summertime, those guys would go out there and if there was a couple lawn encroachment issue that didn't allow the pop-up to go all the way back down, those earwigs would get inside there and pff, literally break themselves in half trying to get a drink. And they get it all clogged up. So you gotta take the nozzle off and you gotta blow it out and clean the filter and do all the things that are inside there and then reassemble it and move on. I always kind of suggest as a way of checking all the spray heads and the rotor heads, is just turn everything on and see how it's working. Maybe you have to make little micro adjustments, either turning the barrel of the pop-up itself 
or adjusting the rotor head so if it happened to get uh, knocked a little wonky and instead of spraying on a perfect angle that you need, now all of a sudden it, it comes back and it waters part of the patio or it hits part of the house or whatever. And then just readjust it. And sometimes there's no explanation as to why they have turned out like this. They just are. You're not watching it every single day so you don't know why it happened. But if you do have professional lawn care and stuff, I'm telling you straight up, <laughs> oftentimes they're the biggest culprit. Not knowingly necessarily, but they're the biggest culprit of lawn nozzles, rotor heads, canister heads becoming a problem. You know, over time, some of the spray devices, pop-up lawn heads, like the, the wiper seal will get worn out or it'll get uh, brittle. The rubber caps and the seals on rotors, when they pop up and down, they will get brittle and sometimes you got to start replacing things. I think people end up replacing the wiper seals and the caps a lot more than they replace anything else. Maybe nozzles is in there as well, but there are specific ones and inexpensive little hand tools you can get to make these repairs a lot faster and a lot easier. There's specific screwdrivers for the rotor heads that you can put into the slots and turn and adjust everything that's needed. I don't know about some companies, but I was kind of a rainbird guy and there was a rainbird plier that would allow you they made it so that you could hold it when it's popped up you could actually clamp onto it and the pop the pop-up barrel would not retract so you could check the nozzle clean the nozzles do all the things you have to do and they're kind of neat you can find them online they're they're out there still all right moving on parts and pieces you know whether we're talking pvc poly pipe connectors of any kind, solenoids, wire nuts, pipe clamps, and a myriad of others make up the system you or someone else installed. Without them, psh, hey, face it, nothing is going to work correctly, and water goes everywhere except where you want it. So all those parts and pieces are replaceable, and some will have to be updated or fixed eventually, depending on a couple of things. How good the installation was, where is it located in reference to maybe other improvements that might be happening later on down the road. To me, the best insurance to remain as maintenance-free as possible is proper installation practices, period. A couple of things that I used to teach is, remember, no over-tightening. No over-tightening. We're dealing with plastics and everything, so everything should be, like when you're putting a male adapter into the bottom of an anti-siphon valve, don't put it in a vise and get huge channel locks and just keep wrenching and wrenching and wrenching on there. That's not good installation practice. You can wrench them down, but make sure that you have Teflon tape. Make sure that you go slow so you don't heat those threads up and everything will be good. If you over tighten, oftentimes you'll get a micro crack. You put everything together, you turn everything on and boom, there you got a leak at the, the base of one of your male adapters and now you've got a headache you got to take apart. So go slow and do it right. No over tightening. The other thing is good gluing and good clamping practices, depending on whether you're using PVC or poly pipe. Always use primer if you're doing the solvent route with PVC. And remember to clamp well and follow directions if you're using poly, poly pipe and the barbed L's and T's and that kind of stuff. Always tighten them down really, really well. It only has to be hand tight. You don't need to get an, an impact driver to necessarily do it. They'll, they'll be watertight just with a hand tight. And lastly is a good plan from the get-go. You installed it correctly. Everything is working correctly. Nothing is overpressured. That's, that's my two cents on that. When dealing with broken L's and T's, etc., the same repair principles apply. Digging up, exposing, planning, measuring, cutting, and then reconnecting with good gluing practices. The connector in that area will never be like new again. It never will be. Now it's got a Band-Aid on. It's like having a broken leg. It's never going to be like it first was. But I'll just understand that and make sure that you put back in all the dirt, pack everything back down, especially if it's in the lawn, and be able to not have a divot or a place where water is going to collect out there. Remember when you're gluing practices, always the colder the temperatures are out when you're putting things together, the longer curing time you're going to have. And the exact opposite. If it's hotter, those joints are going to cure a lot faster. As a pro, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, man, put everything together and let it cure overnight. Is that 
reality? No, that is not reality, but it is what I'm gonna tell you. If you can afford the time, then let them cure overnight. You know, spending just a little time periodically on your very expensive irrigation system can add years and years to good, correct system performance. It really will. You cold weather folks with irrigation, hey, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but don't forget to winterize and evacuate the water out of your system when cool and cold temperatures approach and watering is no longer needed for those winter months. There are several, several YouTube videos out there to show you exactly how to do it with big machinery and stuff that you have around the house too. So there you go. Simple approach to irrigation system, inspection, maintenance, and repairs. Hey, check out next week's episode where I will apply the same conscientious approach to low voltage lighting systems as well. I hope you have time to join me. I really do. Hey, check out the YouTube channel, Plan of the Week, and any of the other episodes that I have out there. You can learn quite a bit of stuff. I really appreciated your time. As always, to your landscape success, don't forget the website, youryardcoach.com. Got a free giveaway there and also the book and the digital course. I would really appreciate your patronage. It helps to go pay for a lot of things. Thanks guys, catch you next week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.